Welcome into the Odds and Audibles podcast. I'm Matt Prem, Eric Scopel, Jared Mack on the show. Tuesday edition. It's been about three or four weeks since we've done a Tuesday podcast after we did a Monday podcast. But National Signing Day uh, is basically almost here. Uh, we are on the eve of National Signing Day. Um, so we are going to talk all things Oregon football recruiting on this one. Get you ready to go for tomorrow, which is shaping up to be an eventful day. The Ducks currently are 14th in the country, guys. They have 23 verbal commitments. They've got a five-star verbal commitment in Jerry on Dickey. They have some junior college prospects committed. They've got some JUCO players committed. Um, they are near the top of the Pac-12 conference as well, if I'm mistaken. They may be still number one, um, but it's been an eventful couple of weeks. It's an eventful couple of days. There's been a lot to get to. We'll talk about the Dante Moore stuff. We'll talk about some of the other things that are transpiring for Oregon football. But right now, just kind of stand above this class and what stands out. I, I, I'm i hot and cold on this class. Like I think that's, for me, what the standout thing here is. They've got a lot of talent. They've got a lot of players from good states. I mean, they've hit Texas hard. Four verbal commitments. Um, don't normally see that. They've gone across the country. Um, but I don't know beyond – Maybe the top two guys, Jerion Dickey and Kenyon Sadiq. I don't know if there's anyone in here that's like, oh, he's definitely 100% playing in 2023. I, I don't know. So that's kind of like my. I'm all, I'm 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 positive and negative with this class. Negative maybe isn't the right word, but. Well, here here here's where it comes to me is, is we talk what what have we talked about being kind of needed in terms of an infusion of talent? And it's on defense. And you look at this class right now, and we'll get to it later, but there's some there's some rumblings that Caleb Presley, the, the, the highest-rated defensive commitment right now, might flip to Washington on signing day. He's a top 200 corner recruit from the Seattle area. There's a lot of kind of UW momentum there. He visited there a few times. If that ends up being the case, you look at this class now and go, well, there are a ton of four-stars in this class, but – None would be, I think, in the 247 top 24-7 because Amari Washington and Cole Martin, who are your, your highest rated defensive recruits, I believe are outside of the 24-7 uh, top 247. It's, it's, so, it's so annoying that we call it the, the top 247. Um, I understand why from a marketing perspective, but it's hard to say, I guess. Um, but yeah, all, those guys are, are borderline kind of like mid four star recruits and you want it to have some star power here like you look at it right now the way things are stacked up your top four recruits would all be skill position guys which is which is great in terms of building an explosive offense but Oregon already kind of has an explosive offense Oregon already has a lot of good receivers running backs tight ends which is as Matt said you look at it Dickey would be the you know I think will be undoubtedly the number one signee as a five star second best receiver in the country. It's a player to get really excited about, a guy who could have and probably should have an immediate impact. <clears throat> I feel similar to Matt about Sadiq having an early role just because as a tight end, he's unique from the rest of the tight ends on the roster, and you can kind of split him out and have a specified role right away, even though he might be a little undersized at 6'3", 220 for the position. But as we've established, that's kind of a, a hot sort of uh, type of prospect with the way Brock Bowers has played. You look at Dante Dowdell, the running back. I think he's somebody who could – maybe carve out a short yardage role or contend for, for reps. And then if Presley's not in the class, the fourth highest rated is Ashton Cozart, a receiver from Texas. Explosive, I think, speed guy. I think that's a guy who I don't expect to have a role right away. So we've already run through. They're your top four recruits are all on the offensive side of the ball as skilled positions. Like Oregon's already good at those spots. I'm not saying you don't need to recruit there, but I think it's a little underwhelming in terms of the star power of this class, if you want if you want to be frustrated, which I think a lot of people are right now, that there just isn't like a, a, a borderline five-star or a five-star edge player or a corner or an def interior defensive lineman like that. There are a ton of highly regarded four-star caliber players um, on defense. Like if you look through the rest of the class, there are, I think, five four-stars that are all uh, defensive players. Cole Martin is a corner. D Amari Washington, I mentioned, is a defensive lineman. So is Johnny Bowens and Terrence Green. Those are three 
uh, four-star defensive line prospects. Uh, Blake Purchase is an edge player. There's another Cody DeCambra is a, is a safety. So that you've got some, you've got some four-star rated talent on defense, but you don't have kind of that marquee Justin Flo, Noah Sewell, Kayvon Thibodeau caliber player here. And if you're talking about instant impacts, I don't think any of these guys we mentioned are very likely to have like immediate star roles. So, you know, if you want to look at it from what what we think this class can pre present the team in 23, I'm kind of impervious that there's a lot of immediate contributors on defense, which to me is the area where you're hoping to address. So I think I would say I'm a little, a little disappointed there aren't more big time defensive recruits in this class. I think there are some guys, as Matt said, that could contribute on offense right away. Um, and then, of course, we'll see what happens in the spring, and maybe there are some surprises. We'll get to some names that might be kind of on Oregon's radar here for, for Wednesday. But as things stand right now, I just kind of look at it and go, like, there's not a lot of defensive star power here for me. There's, yeah, I, 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 you guys are both right that there's not a lot of defensive star power. and the, the impact players immediately are probably going to be Dickey and Sadiq. But I don't know. You look at last year's class and there weren't a lot of immediate impacts either. Um, you, I, I know you had Josh Connerly in that 14J package, but that was it. Devin Jackson, the second highest rated commit or signee, excuse me, uh, didn't really see the field except for garbage time at linebacker. Then you go to Jaleel Tucker, Kyla Casper. Florence had the biggest impact, and he was the fifth highest player in the class. And then Jordan James was the biggest impact guy on offense, and he just ran at the goal line all the time he or, or in garbage time. So I'm not necessarily looking at an instant impact guy. I kind of like this class just for the pure depth that they brought. Um, you, Eric went through a lot of the defensive linemen. Um, I've been doing all the defensive linemen signee stories. Um, these guys are good, and I think there's a there's some – good disparity between what their composite score is and what their top 247 score is like Blake Purchase is a top 125 player in the country according to the top 247 but he falls almost near the 300 rank in his composite score so there's some differential there I really like his film he's somebody who frankly I think could be an instant impact guy um, he's in that kind of tweener edge role but what I think he does best is he actually gets out of the pass coverage and can cover white or light or uh, running backs coming out of the backfield or tight ends, something like that. Um, I think there are some potential instant impact guys, but I don't necessarily look at the need for a potential impact guy from a lot of recruiting classes, unless it's like a star quarterback or a star defensive end. And yeah, there, there, there isn't that. And the Teo Uyunglele is still on the board as a potential star impact guy that Oregon could still land. Um, but uh, you, you look in years past and other than Noah Sewell and Kayvon Thibodeau, who are, you know, obvious NFL guys, they haven't had too many instant impact defensive players. And I think it's just the name of the game. I think it's harder for a defensive guy to come in and learn the system and immediately develop and immediately jump in and start playing rather than it is for um, a wide receiver if they're correctly used. Um, you know, if you think of what the offense might have looked like in 21, if Kenny Dillingham were the offensive coordinator where you have Thornton, you have Franklin, they could have gotten in more um, and I think Will Stein will will use uh, Jurion Dickey and Kenyon Sadiq where he feels fit. Um, I just think that overall, I'm I'm fine with the class. Uh, top 15 classes. It's currently ranked second in the Pac-12. I think it's a lot of depth that they bring in on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and I think Dan is kind of bringing in this this implementation of what Georgia did, where it's like, hey, we're just going to stack up on all the four-star defensive linemen. Um, we're going to always have fresh guys. We're going to hope that we develop two or three of them into, into a, a starter, a power five starter. And then we really can just substitute guys over and over. And, and they kind of tried to do that through the transfer portal this past season. Um, and they did. They always had fresh defensive linemen. They just weren't uh, edge rushers, which is what Oregon needs the most at this point. So, But overall, I think the class is fine. I think it's a good class. I think it hurts that Dante Moore decommitted and kind of loses the star power luster of it. But the depth is there and the talent is there, too. And the, and the potential for development is there as well. And to Jared's point, like every football coach will tell you football is a developmental sport. And oftentimes you get your best outcomes in two or three down years down the road. So, you know, they are, like Jared did say, they have loaded up a ton of depth. Um, and I think it also kind of speaks volumes, guys, to just – a, the, the expectation at Oregon now has changed, where seven years ago, ten years ago, 
if you told Duck fans, hey, you're going to be second in the conference, you're going to be top 15 nationally in the rankings, everybody would be ecstatic about that. And maybe like what Jared said, the Dante Moore departure, maybe over, you know, casts over the, the, the joy of this class, the positivity of this class, a little more than normal because of how late the decommitment happened. But a top 15 class, and we're kind of like, yeah, but there's still some holes here and there. I think that kind of speaks to maybe just the evolution of the program from a recruiting expectation standpoint year over year. Well, um, my, my only point is that, like, when Dan got here, the expectation was he would hold serve with what was here before. And I think sure. this, this class has fallen off a little bit compared to what it was before, is, is, is all right. I would say in terms of in terms of top tier talent and in terms of where this class is going to finish from a ranking perspective. I understand there could be some more moves, but you remove Presley, you drop from 14, I think, to 17. You're going to add a couple of players we think on signing day. We'll get to some of that. I just think the totality of this class, and maybe I'm being the wet blanket right now, I just think this is a little bit underwhelming from an early signing period compared to, and I, I hate to cast a shadow on the class because I do, as Jared said, I think there's a lot of good players. And Matt, you're right, the expectations have improved, but and changed and certainly 10 years ago you would look at this completely differently at the same time the expectations have changed because oregon wants to be considered a contender and I, don't, I don't know if this class is a class that you look at and say it separates you from much of i mean obviously the conference but from the other teams that are trying to contend it, it doesn't separate in my opinion so that that's that's the only reason i'm being critical because I, I think the expectations have been elevated and if you ask me i don't i think this class doesn't quite reach the expectations that most people had for what Dan was selling early on this cycle, especially with all the big names they're in on. So uh, well, I'm even probably, a month ago, I'm probably, I'm probably being a little bit, like I said, of a, a wet blanket, but I, I'm just being kind of honest on where I think people thought this class was going and where it ended up arriving at. All right. What do, what do we, when we look at this recruiting class, um, what stands or what are the top commits right now? Like, I think obviously Dreon Dickey is the most is the highest rated guy. He's the only five star. But like let's let's eliminate him from the discussion because that would be easy for all of us just to say, oh, the Darion Dickey is the highest rated guy that that that's on the team, so that stands out the most. Like it, it, and maybe it's a positive or a negative. Like to me, I'm kind of surprised to Eric's point. Like they haven't necessarily added a guy yet that you look at and say, Yes, he is going to be a day one edge rusher for Oregon. Like, and that could even be a this is gonna be a blast from the past. A Kenny Rowe. I, I don't know if Eric Jared probably doesn't, but because it was before his time. But do you remember when he showed up as a true freshman? Like he left as a dominant player at Oregon. But when he was a true freshman, it was very clear all Kenny Rowe was in for was pass rush. Like everyone knew, oh, Kenny Rowe's in. Oregon thinks it's a pass. So we're, you know, that's what that's what they're they're out there for. And he only played like a handful of snaps, but it was just because he was a special pass rush guy. Is Blake purchased that player? Possibly. Is uh Tidum Tuioti that player? Possibly, but I there isn't that bona fide guy yet. Maybe maybe it's uh someone like a, a, a Amari Washington from Arizona, or maybe they can go in and they can pluck Ashton Porter from Texas and he fills that role. Or maybe Dan's defense doesn't need that fast twitch, speedy guy off the edge. And, you know, the simulated pressures will, will create the pressures regardless of it. I think that's just the interesting thing. Even when you factor in the transfer portal. Like, I don't know. I, I, I think that, to me, from a negative standpoint, is what stands out. And then I also just love, to Jared's point, like, whether they're – maybe they're not a, an elite, spa, pa, elite pass rush specialist – but they have loaded up on D linemen. And I like where the D linemen are coming from. Texas, they've got multiple guys there. And then they've got some guys from Arizona coming in as well. Um, I think they're going to be really good against the run down the road. No, and that's probably, if you want to, I mean, because offensively we've kind of addressed, I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. They've got some skill players out wide. I think Dowd I, I've been and continue to be a really big fan of what Dante Dowdell can be. Um, so I don't know if we need to rehash that. The class obviously needs a quarterback, but we'll get to the Dante Moore part. That 
pan. Obviously, you weren't going to recruit another quarterback while he was still committed. That would have been a blunder. Um, you know, I think offensively, if you get if you want to be more critical, the offensive line probably lacks a little star power as well. I don't think there's any question there. They've got a couple of four stars, but they're both kind of on the back end. Silva's a big time JUCO. Some projects that kind of fill out the rest of the class. But I think if you want to look at it defensively and, and, and in terms of a positive, like I'm not sure how many immediate impact players you have, but you certainly have recruited from a body type perspective to give yourself a chance to have a really deep defensive line going forward. And I, I actually really appreciate the, just the consensus of the body types they're going after here of guys that are coming in close to 300 pounds that can be interior defensive linemen, guys that are tall and, and have some length that can be maybe more um, on the defensive end on the outside, maybe can tr- cross train a little bit, do a little bit of edge as well. I, I just think that you have a nice versatility of defensive linemen who, again, I, I don't think are probably instant impact players. But between Green, Bowens, Washington, we think they'll probably land Porter. Um, those four, if that's the four you end up signing on the defensive line, three from the state of Texas, um, some legitimate size and athleticism, I, I think you can be really excited there. And, and I do like the edge players they're bringing in. I just don't know how many of them are immediate impact guys. Like, I really like Tatum Tuioti. I've seen him live. Um, all the uh, the people we speak to in the recruiting industry have raved about him. That's why he has moved up significantly in the 24-7 side of the rankings. Jaden Moore was a guy whose film I remember thinking really popped as a pass rusher. Like Matt mentioned, the, the Kenny Rowe type who kind of has a very singular role, I guess, early on. I'm not sure Jaden Moore will be this because uh, – I mean, if he's an if he's an elite pass rush right away, maybe he will because they, they won't they'll lack some opportunities there or, or some I guess uh, options there. But Jaden Moore is somebody who really stands out in terms of his ability to get after the passer. So I like him as a long term player. So I like I really like what they've done from a depth long term perspective on the defensive line at edge. I think they've added some difference makers there. I'm just again I, my my thing is I think when you look at recruiting. You'd like to have a couple of guys that are instant impact players. You didn't see any in this last year's on this last year's team. Really, it was pretty limited, and I'm not sure you see a whole lot for this upcoming season. And that can be okay. that's fine. Doesn't you don't have to have a bunch of them. Um, but typically, you look at the history under Mark Cristobal and previous staffs, and there were four to six guys that were playing significant roles. Probably, you know, and some of them were more special teams related roles. So maybe it was like three to four that were playing sizable roles early on, but. Usually you have a little bit more of that. I don't have in front of me the number of starts by year. I know I did that story a year ago. I'll go look for it in a moment here just to kind of compare and contrast. But it, it does feel like the number of instant impact guys, at least on the – again, we're looking at this before anyone's enrolled, so who knows? A guy could enroll in the spring and be the team's top corner immediately. Who knows? A guy could enroll and be you know an instant impact player that we're not expecting. But – Looking at it from my perspective, I just don't see a ton of that on defense. And I think that's the only part that really kind of concerns me. Um, but I do think, to Jared's point, and if, if you want to think to get excited about is just the, the depth you've, you've recruited along the defensive line and at edge. Well, and, you know, everybody, including us, complained about Oregon's defensive lapses this past season. Well, a majority of this class is now defensive players, uh, a, a big majority, too. And yeah, I understand that there's no big time top 10 players in the country, the five star guys. But again, uh, as we've said all year long, that the uh, significant reason as to why Dan Lanning and Tosh Lupoy's defense didn't work is because Dan and Tosh didn't get their guys who could fit this system. Here they are. This is their first opportunity to showcase this. And I, I, you know, I think it's a difference in opinions and methods as well between Mario and what Dan's trying to do in terms of entering the transfer portal and getting a couple of names there on top of adding it to um, your, your four stars in your, in your recruiting class. Because I, again, we've, we've talked about this on the podcast before. Yeah. You can land a five-star kid, but they might not be immediate impact ready or impact ready at all. You look at Justin Flo, who I, again, different scenario and I don't want to you know, uh, sound mean about it or anything like that, but he gets injured obviously and never makes a significant impact at Oregon. Um, and you never really know with these recruiting cycles because I have a player like Brandon Dorless, who was one of the worst players in his recruiting class, ends up being the best player in Oregon's defense for a year and a half, nearly almost two full, two full calendar years. Um, 
I just think it's 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 tough. It's recruiting. This is why people get paid the big bucks to accurately recruit these players, and this is why um, it's a cluster sometimes with with fan bases because they they assume that the, the five star that's attached to the the name of the player is indication that he's going to be an instant impact guy. And I agree with both you guys that it's not necessarily the bill of goods that Dan was trying to sell us at the beginning of his tenure and how many uh, names that he was in on and the, and the school itself was in on and that Oregon isn't, you know, it hasn't landed any of them yet, except for jury on Dickey landed more, but obviously he decommits for other reasons that are beyond Oregon's control. Really. I mean, they're still in with a lot of guys, but I don't think we all, I don't think we all feel that positive about their chances of landing these other five-star players, but you look at players in the transfer portal those are immediate impact guys. Those are proven impact guys at other schools who are now coming to Oregon to be an immediate impact guy there. So I think the difference in philosophies is 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 tough to get around because it's changing so rapidly. I mean, Mario's last season at Oregon transfer portal was a thing, but it wasn't as um, significant as it is now in terms of how many players were running the portal and you know, Oregon got a bunch of transfer portal additions last season who were immediate impact guys, and I would expect them to do the same this year. Um, I still, I still like this class. It's the same that I that I said earlier about the depth and everything like that. Um, like someone like Terrence Green, who I really like, who uh, on tape always appears to be the largest man on the field. Uh, Tavita Pome is also another guy who's a huge human. You guys talked about Tatum Tuioti. Um, I think he recorded 30 tackles for loss this past season at Sheldon High School, which is an outrageous number. Will that translate to college? Maybe, maybe not. But that that's the fun of recruiting is these underrated players like Jaden Moore, whose film I also liked. Um, like, yeah, maybe they're a three-star and they're like the 70th best edge rusher in the, in the country, but they come into college and just because they weren't scouted enough or they learned something in the offseason or they hit a growth spurt, whatever the case may be, they become an instant impact guy. So overall, I, I'm going to, at this point in, in Dan's first full recruiting cycle, I'm going to put my blind faith into him and his staff and his evaluations um, with this recruiting cycle, especially on, on the defensive side of the ball. Let's take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, we'll dive into the unfortunate news that transpired on Monday with Dante Moore where Oregon goes from here and some other things to be watching on National Science Day because it's going to be exciting. All right, welcome back to the Otson Audible's podcast. Um, Dante Moore has flipped to UCLA. Um, we don't need to go much into why that happened or, you know, the transpires of it. But what does Oregon do next? Um, I think Eric was the one that brought it up that said Oregon now needs to find a quarterback in this recruiting class. Um, we've debated on this show a couple times, like portal high school guy. I think all of us have kind of come to the consensus that find a high school guy if you can, because finding a portal guy, it's going to be difficult, especially with Bo Nix's return to Oregon. Um, we can say the name now. Uh, Austin Novosad is linked to Oregon. He's a Baylor commit. Um, Steve Wiltfong has him as a guy to watch on signing day to see what he does. And the interesting there is, can, can Oregon get him to flip? Um, can Oregon get him to hold off signing his letter of intent with the Baylor Bears? Off, Austin Novosad's a four-star Elite 11 Quarterback out of the state of Texas, Will Stein offered him when he was at uh, UTSA. Um, obviously, Austin and uh, I think it's Drip Springs, Texas. That's such a phenomenal name of, of a town. Um, is really close to Austin, so there's some connection there with Stein. That's maybe the biggest thing I'm watching on Wednesday is – 8 a.m. Central Time. Does Austin Novosad's NLI go into Baylor? If not, and the day goes longer and longer, and it hasn't been sent in, that's more and more good news, positive momentum towards Oregon, I think. Um, we could see Caleb Presley flip 
like Eric mentioned a couple times, to Washington. Um, and then there's just, you know, a bunch of five stars that, like Jared said, I don't know if Oregon really is the school for any of them, but they're there. They're in the thick of it. And signing day always delivers some kind of surprise, um, whether it's for Oregon or whether it's just across the board nationally. Every year you get some, you know, some five star surprises. Can Oregon muster one? Um, this is a, it's been a long time guys since we've gone into a Wednesday and it's always been like, well, there's maybe one or two things that could go this way or that way. It, this is like 13 different different guys that could could make widely different decisions that could alter positively and negatively this entire perspective of this class. Yeah, and we and to to, to the point about uh I think it's Novo sad, sad. I think that's how you would pronounce it based upon spelling. And Dripping Springs, Texas is a great name for a city, and it feels very appropriate that that's in Texas. If he were to flip from Baylor to Oregon, he would become the class's second highest rated player, uh, currently the 10th best quarterback in the country based upon the composite. We have him at nine in the 24-7 specific rankings. Big-time prospect, and to get, you know, if that's your, I guess, fallback option, I think you feel pretty good about it. Um, I was going to draw a comparison to when Oregon went from DJU to Jay Butterfield in 2020, but then I realized, well, it didn't really matter because they were probably going to strike out with which either one they ended up with. Um, and maybe Jay Butterfield is not, you don't feel great. If Austin Ovisad becomes Jay Butterfield from a career perspective, plays at Oregon three years and transfers, that's probably not exactly ideal, um, especially since you're, uh, you're you're replacing the Dante Moore in the class. But no, I, 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 I really like what he would bring in terms of a, I think it helps to have connections to Texas on the staff. They already have that. They already have that from a recruits in this, in this staff, but also from a marquee quarterback for both trying to finish this class strong in the spring, but also for future years and just having connections to the state of Texas. I think that's something Oregon was obviously very keen on during Chip Kelly's time here and through Mark Kelfrich kind of lost some of those connections when, two coaches who had ties to Florida were the head coach because they focused a lot of their attention in, in areas they were you know, comfortable with, which makes sense. But Texas had been a hotbed for Oregon for the, a lot of the early part of the, you know, 2010s. You look at those teams, a lot of the best players from those teams were from Texas and, you know, just to build a t- pipeline that would be, would make sense and, and kind of harken back to those days. But yeah, Nova Sab would make a lot of sense. And, and in term, to Matt's point, I know, uh, just to all of the activity, he says 13, like legitimately there are 13 different names that we will be watching on Wednesday. You know, he he sent us the, the list of the guys and, and there are actually a baker's dozen people, players we're going to be watching for tomorrow that could end up signing with Oregon that aren't currently committed to Oregon. So there, there will be a lot to pay attention to. And that does include some five-star talent that I think we anticipate will end up elsewhere, but that Oregon is certainly in the picture for. And you can't discount the fact that, like, yes, Caden Proctor is still considering Oregon. There's a lot of Alabama hype, but he's still considering Oregon. Uh, Mateo Uangale is is still considering Oregon. There's a lot of USC hype right now, but the Ducks are still in the picture. Uh, and the same thing for David Hicks. He's, he's, it seems like he's probably going to end up sticking with AM, but Oregon remains a factor. Like, there's three guys where – you know, I think it's kind of unique where the day before signing day, Steve Wiltbaum put, posts his kind of where everything stands and talks about the five stars. And all three of those guys, according to Steve, Oregon remains actual, you know, they're in, a, you know, a, I guess a puncher's chance for not leading for any of them, but remains in the picture. And now we see if they can if they can just pull one of those three. I think the the tenor of this and the perspective of this class changes a little bit. Um just because you lost a five-star quarterback. And again, if they were to replace more with Novasat and then go land one of these five stars, I think, and I know I've been the wet blanket on this podcast, but I, and I hate to say it, it boils down to two recruitments. But it could be a situation where if you've got, let's say it's Mateo and Novasad in the class, I feel significantly better because you've addressed something on the edge with somebody who I think can be an immediate player and you've got now a, a pretty high-end quarterback prospect. If you were to miss on all of that, I would look at this class and be like, you're still, you still have some holes and now you've got to go to the spring and try to finish there and also put ample 
uh, efforts into the portal, which is obviously going to be the case regardless. But uh, no, it'll be, as we said, on Monday's show. Wednesday's going to be quite the day in terms of the Oregon recruiting. You guys have touched on all, all of the names here, so I just have a question for both you guys. If Oregon never landed a commitment from Dante Moore, but landed a commitment to Novosad, and they and you knew that Bo Nix was coming back for the majority of the season, what would your perception of the class be then? That would be huge. It'd be a huge, awesome signing day flip. Like, I don't know if it, it would be the... I'm no, no. I'm saying that you say Novosad's committed. Novosad's already been committed. He committed in oh, October. Okay, and we knew that Bo Nix was coming back, and they had never landed the commitment of Dante Moore. What is the perception of this Oregon class? The same one, uh, if the, if those t- dominoes fell instead of what it is now. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think you would look at it saying like, hey, they've got their QB for 2023, and they've added another positive option for when Bo moves on, like. The idea would be that Ty and him would compete and maybe they go out and find a, a portal guy in 2024. And it wouldn't be, it would be like what exactly what UCLA did go find like a Kent state uh, group of five power five QB and tell them, Hey, you're probably going to be the front runner to win the job, but we've got some talented underclassmen that might beat you out. I'd, I'd still be saying they needed to add better defensive prospects like or at least t- more top a couple top tier defensive prospects that would still be my concern but you would you would feel like more boxes were checked for longer and i think again the thing with the quarterback position and i don't think it's going to bite oregon the way some fans thought when dante flipped is that sometimes there is a domino effect of your quarterback and the class itself so maybe if nova mm-hmm. had been committed in let's say May, I think, was that about when Dante committed? May or June, something yeah, like that. Yeah, May or June, yeah. Maybe Oregon would have a couple additional commitments from the Texas area that would kind of bolster the class a little bit, and so you'd have some a, a little different momentum. Um, but I'm not sure how much it would reshape things. And again, if they if they if they land, I mean, to me, it's to me, it's go find. I just think you need more difference makers on defense. That, that's, that's just yeah. continues to be my gripe. So like, and there are guys out there that might not sign. We can get to some names of guys that might not sign early that Oregon remains in on. And if they were to land two or three of those in February, I'd have a different opinion and shoot. Like they might have a guy like Josh Connerly last year, wasn't part of last year's class until what was that June? Like, I mean, they yeah. might, mm-hmm. they might, there might be a late addition at that point too. So, um, but no, I think it's a fair question, Jerry, in terms of just how does that, how would that reshape things? I think, a uh, question back would be like, okay, you lose Dante Moore, you lose Caleb Presley, uh, Presley, he flips the UW. But what if that opens the door for Oregon, whether it's going to happen from a recruiting perspective or we factor in the NIL commitments that we're going to have to go to those two players, particularly Moore, can maybe get spread out to a couple other players. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden they add Nova sad and they also add Dalen Austin and Roderick pleasant. Dalen Austin is considering maybe signing on Wednesday when he was like one of the guys Eric was mentioning uh, of potentially waiting and Roderick pleasant uh, pleasant is also considering uh, or is, is leaning towards not signing with anybody in December and will sign in February. I think he's actually on the record saying he won't be. And both those players are highly rated corners. So, like, what if the trade-off is, yeah, you lose Dante Moore, the number three player in the country, the most ready-made quarterback, as a lot of our national guys have said, for the 2023 season. But you get Bo Nix back. You add a top 10 quarterback who maybe doesn't have as high of a floor as Dante Moore right now. You lose Caleb Presley, but you add two better cornerbacks on top of that. Um, then, then Caleb Presley. I, I think the, the the return of Bo with adding, basically going two for one at corner with two better players or two higher rated players at a position where you know, like, you need a lot of help there at corner, and mm-hmm. um, Bo was always going to be the better option than Dante Moore in 2023, whether they were on campus together at Oregon or if he had to pick one. I, I don't know, like that, that that would be another like I guess like a half glass type full perspective of maybe yeah, maybe you lose the long term impact at quarterback, but it helps you secure some other guys 
at other positions that have a quicker path to the field. And and to be clear, for me, the portal is all is is going to be where hopefully you find immediate difference makers. And yes. if, if Oregon finishes up the portal class with let's say six to seven, like they did last year, about ten players that are immediate players on defense specifically, I mm-hmm. I, I will feel less concerned with this cycle. I, I still won't think it's a huge win. I still think there are obviously really talented players in this class, but they go out and they can find two quality edge players that can find another corner. They can find a couple linebackers and they can find maybe one quality interior defensive lineman with, I think a couple of years of eligibility. I mean, very right. specific, but if they like, if they, if they can round out the portal stuff, then I'll probably care a little bit less about this class. But my concern is, you know, you're in a position and, and maybe I, again, I'm probably, I said, I used the word earlier. I'm probably being a wet blanket and I think that's probably fair. To a certain degree, I just look and think there are so many defensive deficiencies and so few have been addressed so far. I like the two portal additions on defense a great deal. They they need to find more players in the portal. And you would feel I think you just would have less pressure. Either way, you'd have less pressure if you had a five star or a guy or a guy or two you could point to and say, I think he mm-hmm. is an immediate impact player on defense. And you're right, Jared. Like purchase, I, I had forgotten how highly twenty four seven thought of him. So maybe maybe that's a player, and, and I did like his film. Maybe that's a player that, that does come in and have an impact right away. I don't know, um, but typically guys rank outside of like the top fifteen. And as you said, there are players, plenty of players are going to sign who were in the top fifteen, who were five star prospects at high school, who had next to zero immediate contributions. So. Mm-hmm. Not to talk out of both sides of my mouth. So maybe it doesn't matter. And I'm, I mean, that's one of the things I've, tr- I've I've tried to I've tried to kind of temper expectations with is, is is with immediate impacts with recruits because we got really up in arms about like Kingsley Sumatia is going to be a, a dude and he was gone by Halloween of his freshman year. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, well, it's it's difficult to project. I just think you you look at the way this class and part of it again is expectations of all the names they were in on. Obviously, the Dante Moore part, losing him hurts. But, like, there were seven to eight guys, aside from Dickey and Moore, that Oregon was in on. I think we all agreed, like, okay, well, if they land two of them, maybe that would be a huge win. Right. If you end up with one five-star and one top 100 player in your class, I just think that's a little underwhelming to me. If you're a program like Oregon that's trying to maintain pace with schools like Alabama, and I know that you're not actually going to do that, but if that's what your goal is – and then you look up and you see that some of these big schools legitimately landed like 18 players in the top 100, you know, 12 players yeah, in the yeah. top 100. It's just, it's just, dis- so, it's a little deflating because you're just so far off the, the mark right now. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I want to bring up something. You all, you were, you were right there with the Kingsley thing. And why, why did he leave Oregon? He wanted to go closer to home, right? Well, when you look at years in, in the past in Oregon's recruiting cycles where they're able to get these high four stars and, high, and five stars, they're all within like the West Coast or at least the Pacific Northwest footprint. If you want to include Utah, I, I, it's kind of hard. I don't know where to put that. But then you look at what the, the, the top prospects were in California this season, where Oregon has done very well in the past. And now, you know, they have to deal with USC getting better and stuff like that. But even still, they've done really well there in the past. Um you know, the, the best player that's still available is Mateo Uyunglele, which fits the bill, that fits the defensive needs. But of the top 10 players in the state of California this year, only four of them were defensive players. There were five quarterbacks, four or five quarterbacks, and then there were three cornerbacks and then DJ. Not DJ, Mateo, Mateo. excuse me. So you look at that footprint and you look at after that, um, the, the next best defensive lineman in the state of California is in the 150s. Blake Nicholson, a linebacker, is 175. These are their composite scores. And then you have a bunch of running backs, wide receivers, some more quarterbacks, the tight ends. There just aren't as many impactful defensive players this season who are on the West Coast. And then you look at it and you go, you look at Jaden Wayne, who eventually moves and plays at IMG, I think, who you know moves to Florida and then is committed to Miami. Um, Oregon is never a state that you can rely on for top top end talent. And you look at all the, the five-star prospects that Oregon is going after. Caden Proctor, Iowa. David Hicks, Texas. Obviously, Mateo Uyunglele is California. from California. Dante Moore, Michigan. Uh, these are not 
places that are near the state of Oregon. And a lot of times in recruiting, we've talked about this multiple times in the podcast. When I'm here, I'm sure you guys have talked about this for years in the past. A lot of times these decisions from 17, 18, 19 year old kids ultimately have a lot to say about where they're going. Is it close to home? Is it not close to home? The nice thing about California was, you know, there's a major airport, um, you know, in, in San Francisco or in the LA area, there's tons of them. That's a, you know, it's an hour and a half. It's a two hour flight from those places. So yeah, it's not close to home, quote unquote. Same thing with Seattle, not close to home, quote unquote, but very manageable. When you're flying from Texas, and I know there's a couple direct flights now from Dallas to DFW to Eugene, but and Detroit and Iowa and Florida and these other places, it's a little more difficult. And I just think that Oregon, especially this class, this class specifically, they haven't been, um, you know, the, the, the fields haven't been as rich as they had been in years previous on the West Coast and when, in terms of defensive impact guys and um, other positions of need that they need right now. If they needed a quarterback right now, great, a running back, blah, blah, blah. But they're set with the skill position. They got a lot of talent there. They need the guys to do – uh, they need the down linemen, they need the edge rushers, they need the linebackers, and there just aren't a lot of them on the West Coast this recruiting cycle. There, there will be in the future, I'm sure of it, but this recruiting cycle, it feels like there just isn't the the same amount of, of players. And I think we had either Greg Biggins or um, Brandon Huffman talk about this as well as on one of our Ots and Audible's podcasts. And, and it still reigns true. It reigns true to this day on, on how Oregon is trying to get these guys to come from multiple states across the country to, to come to Oregon, which is, has always been a factor in play and always been a factor and distance has always been a factor in, in where these guys end up going. Let's end the, the show with this question. Um, how do we think we're going to view this class in about 36 hours? When Dan Lanning announces the signing class, let's just say like – they lo- let's just say they let's let's look at the names here real quick. Yeah, do that. Uh, they 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 lose Presley um, to Washington, but let's say they they throw in and they get an Ashton Porter. Um, they get a Jaden Lamar. Um, Jaden Lamar. They get a Jamari Johnson, who's a potential flip from Louisville. Um, let's throw in Solomon Davis, a cornerback, um, who's was at Stanford this past weekend, was previously committed to Arizona. Um, let's throw in, they land offensive linemen from the transfer portal, Junior Anguilla, um, two-year starter, three-year player for the Longhorns, would be an instant starter for Oregon. Um, it's probably going to be a top 15 recruiting class. Like, I would look at that finish and say, like, it's not the best. It's certainly far from the worst. And the most important thing is it it gives Oregon some clarity of where they need to address positions in. Oh, let's throw an Austin Novus head too. Let's say he he comes. Um, It gives them a clear cut priority of where they need to address needs, whether it's through high school ranks, whether it's junior college ranks, or whether it's through just strictly through the transfer portal ahead of the February signing period. And I think for a program like Oregon, that's kind of what you want. I, I think you want to go into the next period with a clear cut idea. Hey, we need to solve these three areas or these two position groups. And that's it. You don't want to be sitting here saying, well, we need to add a quarterback. Boy, we really need to add a couple corners. We really need a pass rush guy. Oh, what about that linebacker group? We also st- still need to add that that player to this mix. Oh, and we still need an offensive lineman. Like when you're sitting here scrambling to fill five, six, seven position groups the second period, that's problems. And I, I, I think we can, we can see Oregon get to where they have only two or three position groups they really need to, to hit home that second period. And and let me now be more of a glass half full person. If you want to look at it like, okay, if you change your expectations and go, let's not worry about contending with Texas A&M and Alabama and Georgia and Ohio State on the recruiting, and you go, USC is not going to be in the conference very soon, and you just want to focus on Pac-12 teams, this class is by far the best class of teams that will be in the Pac-12 come 2024. So if you want to have a 
more regional, more conference championship kind of focus. This class is very good compared to your peers in the conference. Like you look at the composite score right now, Oregon is at 256. I think with the additions Matt's talking about, probably get close to 265, 270, somewhere in that range. Nova Sad would give you a nice bump. Um, Matt, if you want, you could throw it in the class calculator uh, just to see what that number would look like. But the next best class in the Pac-12, if you take out USC again, who won't be in the conference, would be Utah in the 220s, Washington in the 210s. Those teams have a combined nine blue chip players. That's five, five and four star players. Oregon still has 14 if they were to add the guys Oregon that Matt is talking about. That number is like 16 once you remove Presley. Still excellent numbers. So if you want to talk about it that way, and here's why I'm, I'm trying to be glass half full. If you just want to talk about it regionally and want to talk about it in the conference, you certainly have the best class, and that's a real positive thing. If you want to get, again, to the national element of you want to play for national championships, I think this class falls short. And talking about the players Matt's mentioning adding, kind of – doesn't change a ton for me in terms of the the broad picture because again I'm I'm gonna hold serve on my stance that you'd like to just see a little bit more five star caliber talent in this class and I think it's pretty clear they're not gonna add anyone else and that's that's totally fine in terms of hey they're gonna be this is gonna be a really good Oregon class. It's just it's not a class that contends with the other big classes based purely on recruiting rankings. We know how faulty that can be. I know there's been message board posters who talked about it. And have done their own quote unquote studies, which I always think is a funny term for somebody who's just like on a message board to say, I did a study on recruiting. But I'm just like running through and being like, I think somebody said this morning their study on recruiting from Oregon perspective, from like he did, they did like a six year sample, about 50% of the kids never be, become like big time contributors at Oregon. And if you, if you look at it from this class and say, half these guys aren't gonna matter. There are probably going to be the other half that do matter and have significant contributions. And I don't think this mm -hmm. class is lacking players who could at some point contribute at Oregon. I'll make that very clear. I just look, I, mean, I was doing my, my, uh, my little, as J Jared said, he did the defensive line and some of the defensive positions. I was doing some of the offensive positions. I kept writing, I don't see immediate impact, but boy, in two or three years, these guys could contribute. That was basically what my line of thinking was yeah. for everyone except for jury on Dickey and maybe Dante Dowdell and Kenyon Sadiq that I had in my little groups. So I want to be very clear. Like, I, I think there are plenty of guys that in 2024, 2025 could be big contributors. I just don't think this class aside from a couple of guys has many 2023 guys, and that can be totally fine. And I think Oregon will be very competitive in 2023. Uh, assuming they hit the portal really hard. I just don't know if you, if you look at this class as being a class that has, some of that star power. And that's the only part, I guess, that I'm disappointed with. And I'm probably, again, being a bit of a wet blanket this entire podcast. And I apologize for that. I will try to have a better attitude tomorrow. Um, but you just, I woke up today kind of thinking, you look at the class and you just kind of go like, eh, it's just there's some stuff missing that you thought was going to be here with the way things were trending during the summer months. So I did the, the calculator for you. Um, Thank you. The additions of Novosad uh, Jr. Um, and then Ashton Porter. Jamari Johnson and uh, Solomon Davis would give Oregon a score of 267.44, which, drum roll please, after removal of Caleb Presley too, moves them from 14th mm -hmm. to 13th, and they would be first in the conference. But that doesn't factor in any additions that USC wouldn't right. have or any yeah. other schools. But basically, their class kind of stays where they're at right now. Yeah, and I think that's fine. I, I really do. I mean, I, I know that I think I've been talking about out of both sides of my mouth as well, saying like, yeah, there's a lot of depth, but yes, there should be, you know, the need for an, a five star, a heavy hitter, somebody who can make an immediate impact. And I still agree with myself there. I think the depth is really good. I think the impact potential is there. Um, again, this it's recruiting. It's never a, you know, a foolproof methodology of who's going to do what, when, where and how. Um, but there could be a guy who surprises everybody and is an impact guy. Um, and we see it basically every single season. Um, you know, we saw it like this last year with Kamari Terrell was like a special teams dude who was always on the field. And again, it's special teams. Oregon special teams wasn't the best, but it's an impact guy. You know, it's somebody who's out there on the field. Um, and that could, there, there could be definitely, definitely a couple guys in this class who have that opportunity. I, another thing with all the defensive linemen, 
Um, Oregon loses uh, three of their four starters on the defensive line this season. Um, you know, DJ Johnson, Jordan Riley, and Brandon Dorless. I'm, I'm assuming Brandon Dorless goes to the NFL draft, as he should. Um, and then Casey Rogers, I think, still has a decision, but it sounded like he was going to come back for his final year of eligibility. So those are those are opportunities for you to go and fill a hole if you're a defensive line prospect that's committed and signing to Oregon. Um, so maybe there's an impact guy there. Maybe it is Terrence Green or Ashton Porter or, <clears throat> excuse me, whoever it may be. Um, again, I, I think I'm going to blindly trust Dan in his evaluations of these high school recruits and his evaluations of players in the transfer portal, because I think that's what's going to make the difference in this class. If you look at their transfer portal additions, plus their recruitment, their high school, their prep or JUCO commitments, Oregon is, is sitting at the seventh overall class in the country, I believe it is. Um, and that's a, a big time difference than, than 14th or 13th, um, excuse me, ninth, ninth in the country, if you include their transfer portal additions. And I would expect there to be plenty of more transfer portal additions just because they need it. And I think that's, a, that's where you get your immediately, or excuse me, that's where you get your immediate impact guys. It's really from the transfer portal more than it is from recruiting. Um, to answer Matt's overall question about how are we going to uh, look at this class in the next 36 hours? No idea. I genuinely have no idea just because of all of the things that could happen because last, just last week um, on, or on Monday or, or our Monday podcast, we had our Wednesday podcast. We had great confidence in Dante Moore's ability to sign with Oregon. And then this Monday, unfortunately, no, that did not, that did not come to fruition, but, we are sitting here and we've talked about all the five stars that we don't feel comfortable saying that, you know, Oregon's got the, the, their, their best foot forward. Maybe they do. Maybe in the next 18 hours or whatever it is until they, all those guys sign. Maybe Oregon gets that final push that sends them over the finish line and they sign one or two of those guys and then the class suddenly looks a lot better. Um, the recruiting is, is very volatile. It's really fickle. There, there could be you know, a decommitment, uh, someone who pushes back their signing from Oregon's class, from another class, it's all over the place. So, and this year, like you guys have both mentioned before, specifically this year has, is not as set in stone as it has been in years past. Um, even though there's only been one decommitment from the Ducks this year, and that was more on this Monday. Um, so I, I'm, I'm excited. It's going to be hellacious at points. I'm sure of it, trying to keep track of everybody and what they're doing, but I think it'll be a good class regardless. I think Oregon's going to be sitting pretty at the end of the day. Yeah, there's going to be a lot to get to, a lot to watch transpire. Like Jared said, it could go a bunch of different directions. Hopefully you stick with us here on DuckTerritory.com, here on the Austin Audible's podcast. We'll break it all down tomorrow um, as it happens and as it gets completed. Um, And then we'll have a ton of coverage on the site on DuckTerritory.com. Uh, talking all things Oregon Duck football recruiting. And just know that, hey, it's not over. There's still the the, the February signing period. The transfer right. window technically is still open for players to get into the portal. Uh, I think it was Jared that said it yesterday. Like there's going to be that that wave of second commit of portal entries that hit after mm-hmm. bowl season. And bowl season basically wraps up here in about 11 days. Um The playoffs will play out, and those teams will then see another wave. But here in about 12, 13 days, we're going to see a huge rush of another group of transfers, which could drastically impact Oregon, could, you know, positively or negatively. We don't know. But hopefully you stick with us as we see it happen here on DuckTerritory.com and Austin Audible. Until then, you've been listening to the Austin Audible's podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace.